What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another mafia topic. And as the world turns in the mafia, I get questions all the time about a certain hit that we've all seen play out on the big screen. In the film Goodfellas, seen on the right, Joe Pesci would play an individual named Tommy DeVito. He would play the real life version of the guy on the left, Tommy Two Guns D. Simone. I'm constantly asked, who do I think killed Tommy D. Simone? It's a question that I don't have an answer to. But today we're going to get into the life of Tommy Two Guns, a man that at one point an associate would call a true psychopath. The story of Tommy D. Simone, his life. And his very interesting, mysterious death. Next, on Sit Down Shorts, Thomas D. Simone was born May 24th, 1950, in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts, called Cambridge. During his youth, he would move to an area in New York known as Canarsie. Now, the interesting thing about Tommy D. Simone was that the mafia was very much in his blood. His grandfather on his father's side was Rosario Di Simone. Now, Di Simone at one point was the head of the mafia in Los Angeles, California, and he would ultimately shift power away in his later life to his son and uh, Tommy Di Simone's uncle, Frank Di Simone, who at one point was an attorney. Now, Frank Di Simone's brother uh, was Tommy's father. Now, Tommy's father was actually a degenerate gambler from what I understand at one point and actually owned a printing company, which he would subsequently lose at one point due to his uh, degeneracy as a gambler. Now, uh, Tommy D. Simone uh, would have two brothers that would also follow him into the life of the mafia. And actually, at one point, his brother Anthony would actually be killed uh, for becoming from what mobsters called an informant. Maybe they assumed at one point he was a cooperator. Not all that's known about Anthony D. Simone, but I will mention him a little later. Now, the D. Simones hailed from an area of Sicily in Trapani called Salaperuta, seen here on the uh, map just south of Castellamare del Golfo uh, in Trapani. Now, as I said, D. Simone would spend most of his formative years in Canarsie. And from the beginning, Tommy D. Simone uh, very much got quickly involved into a life of crime. His sister would say that he himself uh, was always a short fuse kind of individual. He had a hair trigger temper. Uh, and weirdly enough, unlike the film, Tommy D. Simone was actually uh, pretty big. Uh, he actually was ended up being about six foot two. And by his mid teens, he was involved with criminal associates in the Lucchese crime family. Whenever you mention the Lucchese crime family, Canarsie in East New York, you've got to mention Paul Vario's crew. As we know, Paul Vario really is one of the more underrated members in the history of the Lucchese crime family. He had an absolutely gigantic crew. And this is where D. Simone would do his criminal activities under the auspice of Paulie Vario. And as we know, in the film Goodfellas, Vario would be played by Paul Servino. He would be called uh, Paul Cicero in that film. Now, during the youth at about 15, Tommy D. Simone would become connected with Lucchese associate lunatic Jimmy Burke, who ultimately would be become one of the better earners in the history of the family. Burke would take D. Simone under his wing. And if you've ever seen the film, it is very true that D. Simone would actually begin selling bootleg cigarettes uh, at a young age with uh, another young individual called Henry Hill. Now, Henry Hill would say, now again, I'm, it's very important to understand, Henry Hill is not someone that I would take with a grain of salt. He is someone that opinions uh, decipher and, and are very interesting. His opinions a lot of the time are looked at as lies, but there are some really interesting things he would talk about early in his life. He would say that at one point they were making hundreds of dollars a day 
uh, in the mid 60s selling cigarettes for young kids that are 15 years old. That's a good money uh, amount to be making each day. He would also say at one point that in 1967, according to Hill, that De Simone would kill an individual called Howard Goldstein. Uh, who he had a beef with on the street. There's really very little known whether this actually happened, but it is a rumor that has went around. We're not going to call it fact, but it has been rumored that as young at, as 17, a D. Simone committed a murder. It was said that Goldstein really just, from what I understand, annoyed him in the street at some point, uh, and he whacked the guy. Uh, now, that has never been substantiated, but it is something that it is interesting. Do I believe it? Probably wouldn't put it past Tommy D. Simone, as we'll find out. He was a killer times about six or seven. D. Simone would eventually get into truck hijacking and become very involved with not only extortion, but fencing stolen goods from the truck hijacking that obviously we know that Burke, Vario, and other members of the crew were very involved with at different airports around Queens. Now, in the 60s, Jimmy Burke would come into contact uh, with an individual called Robert McMahon, who was a Fr Air France guard security man that worked at a JFK airport. He would tip off Mr. Burke of a big load of cash coming in to the Air France terminal. And it was very simple. Burke and also D. Simone would get a duplicate key. They would be told when to come. They would walk in and steal about $430,000 in cold hard cash. This was a big score for that crew. Remember, this is the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. A lot of money was moving through the Jimmy Burke crew. Remember, Jimmy Burke was Irish. Henry Hill was only half Italian. Tommy Simone was an associate. This is the amount of money they're kicking up to Vario. Vario was a very rich man, and a lot of it had to do with the Burke Simone group. Now, ultimately, in 19, the early 1970s, um, the big situation that would really shape the life of Tommy D. Simone would happen. Now, I'm going to talk about the situation regarding Billy Bats Ben Vena. We've all seen that uh, in the film. Phil Leotardo, uh, the character played by Frank Vincent, also plays uh, Billy Bats. And we know about, obviously, in the film, they whack Billy Bats, who was a member of uh, of the Gambino crime family. I want to give a little backstory on Mr. Benvena. Now, there is no known photo of Billy Bats, but in 1962, he would actually be arrested by the federal government for selling heroin. He would be involved in a wide-ranging uh, conspiracy done by multiple members of different mafia families. Uh, Benvena would be part of a group uh, called the Ormento Group. John Ormento, big John Ormento, was a huge heavyweight in the Lucchese crime family. He is one of the largest drug traffickers in the history of the mafia. And during the early 60s, Vito Genovese and other members of the mafia were involved in this heroin pushing scheme. Now, Ormento would get jammed up. Uh, other members of other crews would get jammed up. And Billy Batts would get jammed up. Billy Batts would ultimately get hit with a 15-year sentence and head off to prison. Now, Billy Batts, was a member of the Gambino crime family, and at one point was very close with uh, a budding uh, young John Gotti, who we also know was very involved with truck hijacking and other things in the 60s and early 70s. Now, uh, Tommy D. Simone would become involved with uh, Billy Batts in the early 70s. As we know, uh, and the film would talk about, uh, we would uh, be made to believe that uh, a party was hosted by D. Simone and other members at a bar that was run uh, by the uh, Jimmy Burke crew. Uh, they would have you know, hookers there and good food and some alcohol, and they would have a welcome home party for Billy Bats. At some point, Billy Bats makes a, um, you know, underhanded comment at Dami D. Simone. Obviously, as I said, D. Simone had a hair trigger temper. Ultimately, they would whack Billy Bats. It would go down just pretty much as the movie uh, dictates. Jimmy Burke's involved. They would talk about at one point that bats would be buried at a dog kennel in upstate New York. Now, several theories have come up that this just wasn't about a joke that Veda made about D. Simone. A lot of people do believe 
that uh, Jimmy Burke, the greedy individual that he was, uh, wanted to take part. He basically had control of Bent Vena's loan shark customers. And Bent Vena came home, wanted them back. Bent Vena wasn't doing as well as Burke would do with these customers. And Burke wanted the business. So, you know, in retrospect, he kind of just used this as a way to get rid of Bent Vena. There's one thing we can say about Jimmy Burke. He was a master manipulator and would throw anyone under the bus to get what he wanted. And we'll get back to this later. So Tommy DeSimone had a problem. He had killed a made guy without commission or boss approval. And he was just an associate at that time. And that would come back to hurt Tommy DeSimone down the road. Now, DeSimone would be involved in other murders as well. He is a very accomplished hitter. Uh, and he's someone we don't talk about enough. Obviously, he died very young, uh, but he was an accomplished hitter. As we know, uh, he would also kill uh, an individual called Michael Gianco. Uh, and he would be played in Goodfellas by uh, Michael Imperioli, if we remember. Uh, and this murder actually went down very similar to uh, the film as well. Now, Michael Gianco was a young kid who actually served really as like a gopher, uh, a bartender at card games. But he was also a very accomplished thief, from what I understand. He was very good at uh, stealing things. And he was kind of the original protege of, of someone like uh, De Simone or Henry Hill. He was just a, a crew member, hanger on uh, that committed petty crimes for the group. And when they had a card game, he was a bartender. Uh, De Simone would kill him in a vicious rage after he made a joke about De Simone. Now, at one point after this hit, Henry Hill would say this was the first time he truly believed that Tommy De Simone was a psychopath, according to him. Uh, he knew Tommy had a fuse and uh, a hair trigger temper, but this murder was really committed uh for nothing more than a joke. And this was now the second time that his rage due to a joke um, killed somebody. This time it was really, I think, a little more underhanded than the original joke that Ben Vena made. Now, another murder would be committed by Tommy DeSimone as well. And this would again hit very close to John Gotti, who remember by this point in the mid to early 70s was just a, a budding member of the Gambino crime family. He was not the boss that he would become down the road, but De Simone continued to spit in the face of John Gotti. In 1974, an individual called Ronald Foxy Giroth, seen here, uh, would actually start dating the younger sister of Tommy De Simone. At one point, uh, they would get into some sort of argument and allegedly Giroth uh, would assault Tommy De Simone's sister. Now, as we've come across here, that's probably not a good idea because De Simone was a psychopath. Uh, now, it's important to understand that according to multiple people that were involved with the Gotti crew or knew John Gotti, they would say that Gotti looked at Giroth uh, really as a family member. Uh, he was very close with Foxy Giroth, and Giroth was actually a pretty good earner uh, for the Bergen crew. Giroth was very uh, good at um, hijacking. He was a stick-up artist. Uh, and he was someone that was able to make a little scratch for the Gambino crime family. D. Simone would get wind that Giroth assaulted his sister and shot Giroth three times uh, and would kill him at the scene. Now, this would now be two different individuals that were killed close to John Gotti. Now, as we know, on December 11th, 1978, there would be a heist at JFK Airport at the Lufthansa Terminal. We don't need to go into the particulars of what happened here. This is a very talked about story, but it is important to the layout of De Simone's life. Uh, Jimmy Burke, alongside other members of that crew, including Tommy De Simone, would storm the terminal at the Lufthansa uh, cargo terminal at JFK Airport. They would make away with about $6 million in cash and jewelry. And it was one of the largest heists in the history of this country committed by one group. Now, during that heist, it has been alleged that during it, Tommy DeSimone would actually remove a mask that he had on. And this was allegedly very important. Jimmy Burke was irate after this. And I'm going to get into how I think this may have played a part in some of the things that we hear once uh, Tommy DeSimone was whacked. Now, there was an elaborate scheme that would go on here. The truck or van used in this uh, uh, 
robbery would need to be disposed of. There were ultimately different people that were involved in all this from different crime families, including the Bonanos and Gambinos. Uh, ultimately, the dis uh, disposal of the van would be tasked to this individual, Pernell Stax Edwards. Now, he's played in Goodfellas by Samuel L. Jackson. Stax Edwards was a guitar player and a known drug addict. He was also a credit card fraudster, just a real low-level individual, but he would commit crimes for the Vario crew and the Burke crew. He was tasked with getting rid of the van. Unfortunately, though, by this point, he was a, a heroin addict. He got stoned, as the movie talks about, and doesn't get rid of the van. Now, this would be the last murder committed by Thomas D. Simone. He would whack Stax Edwards subsequent to the robbery. Now, uh, as we know, Burke would take out multiple other members of the crew uh, that he wanted to distance himself from. But soon, rather than later, the Lucchese crime family and Paul Vera needed to understand that Tommy DeSimone by this point had done many things that were angering other people. He had taken off his mask at the Lufthansa heist. There were a lot of things that could bother not only Jimmy Burke, but Paul Vario as well. The writing was on the wall. Tommy DeSimone had to be killed. On January 14th, 1979, uh, several weeks before, DeSimone had learned that he was finally going to get his button. He would be relayed info that he was going to become a made member of the family very soon. So he began to be excited, just like the movie talks about. Now, in the film, there's very little background of the night that D. Simone was likely killed. I'm going to give you a little bit of that right now. According to multiple reports, D. Simone, seen very sharply dressed, was seen in a pizzeria owned by Lucchese soldier, Bruno Facciola. Now, Facciola, alongside Peter Vario, were ultimately both seen dressed very good as well. Now, it's alleged that Vario, alongside uh, Facciola, would transport Mr. DeSimone to a home. Now, the home, where that is, is unknown. It was likely in Brooklyn somewhere. Now, during the transport, they would take DeSimone uh, to this meet. DeSimone believes he's going to be made, and he's walked into a room and waiting for him there, in my opinion and most historical opinions, was John Gotti. Now, remember, John Gotti had reason to want Tommy DeSimone dead. At this point, John Gotti started to become a very powerful member in the Gambino crime family, and this was for the unsanctioned hit on Billy Batts, as well as a family member of John Gotti. Ronald Foxy Giroth. Now, do I believe John Gotti actually killed, pulled the trigger? No, I do not. What I believed happened and what a lot of people believe happened is he was led into a room and he would ultimately be killed, tortured, and oversaw by John Gotti. The person that I believe killed Tommy DeSimone was this individual, Thomas Agro. Now, interestingly enough, Agro is also allegedly the one that would ultimately kill Tommy DeSimone's brother, Anthony, as well. Agro, if you know anything about him, he was a total lunatic. He was a hitman. He was foaming at the mouth at the time, just a complete lunatic. Uh, I believe Agro likely tortured Tommy DeSimone alongside Gotti. Gotti was kind of the overseer of all this. Uh, and um, do we ultimately know who put the bullets in the head or ultimately killed Tommy DeSimone? No, but I do believe Agra was directly involved on guidance of John Gotti. And what I ultimately believe happened is Jimmy Burke recognized that Tommy DeSimone was a loose cannon um, and he could give him up on the Lufthansa heist at some point. And I also believe that Jimmy Burke was smart enough to understand that he could kind of dole off DeSimone to the Gotti crew. They would be happy because they got vengeance on Ben Vena and Giroth and he could be moved off from being involved and actually being involved in that Ben Veda hit. Tommy uh, Simone was a fall guy, really, I think. Now, obviously, he had a short temper and did things he shouldn't do. But Jimmy Burke, this is why he was so uh, good as a gangster, because he was able to recognize things like this. Now, that night, uh, or, or subsequent to that night, uh, Mr. Simone was reported missing by his wife, Angela. Um, we've never seen him again. Now, there are varying reports about ultimately what happened to the body 
of Tommy DeSimo that I'm quickly going to get into. Now, according to the streets, many people believe that Tommy DeSimone's body was chopped up uh, and cut up with a chainsaw and thrown in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, there is a differing report uh, from what happened, according to an individual uh, called Greg Bucciaroni. He would say, uh, now, whether we believe Bucciaroni or not, I'm not going to say I do, but I do want to get into his uh, testimony. He would tell um, a, a publication called The a Den of Geek that he grew up in South Philadelphia. At one point, he was involved with the criminal life, this Greg Bucciaroni. And during his youth, he ran with Harry Riccobini's crew and ultimately meet Jimmy Burke in the late 70s. He would say that once DeSimone was killed, uh, Bucciaroni would say that DeSimone's body allegedly uh, was taken to Philadelphia to a scrap metal yard to be disposed of in a pile of scrap metal that was soon afterwards sent to the U.S. Steel Company in Pennsylvania to be melted down as a scrap metal. Bucciaroni would also say that he witnesses an associate of the Gambino family called Richard Bildstein dispose of a dead body in a crushed automobile and place the crushed vehicle into a large scrap metal pile awaiting shipment. And this was done at a scrapyard in the Kensington section of Philadelphia. So there's really differing reports as to what ultimately happened with Mr. DeSimone's body. Now, truly, it doesn't ultimately matter. Do I actually believe Greg Bucciarone? Not necessarily, but I do think it is an interesting uh, thought as to where his body went. The truth was DeSimone was dead. And when we look back on the life of Tommy DeSimone, he had to die. He committed multiple things that you can't do as an associate in a crime family. He killed people that were connected to other powerful people. And he just became a loose cannon and a dead end. Jimmy Burke was just smarter than Tommy DeSimone. And he recognized that you have to kill people like this. They're expendable. And Tommy was. I will say that Goodfellas, though, I think it's a little... It involves Henry Hill a little way too much. It is a very good and actually accurate portrayal of what actually happened to most of these individuals. And it is regarded as one of the greatest films in mob history. I do want to hear from you, though, in the comments below. What do you think happened to Tommy DeSimone? I'd like to hear what you think. As always, if you enjoy this video, make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe so you never miss another.